may have to hear both our shoulders and our world. Keep them in your hands, Lord God, to protect us from harm. Lord, we ask you to extend the protections like that to our friends in Israel, Lord Father, to keep them safe. And we'll give the praise and glory, Lord Father, for all these good things. Lord, as we take up the offering, we just ask for you to come to church and spend money and passion, Lord, to be pleasing to you. We ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. If you would, let's all stand. The first song we're going to sing this morning is Heart of the Herald Angel. <laughs> Yeah. 
another. Page 57. Amazing grace.
granted us this privilege today, Father, to be here with your children today. Father, we ask you, Lord, that you might overshadow each request, the Lord, that has come to you today, Father, each family that's represented, Lord. God, may you provide the needs, Heavenly Master, for that. God has been presented to you this evening. We pray, God, that you just bless, Father, in this hour of service this morning, Lord. Bless your word today, Father, bless us all. We will not fail to praise you for all things God has said and done. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's one more time I get to say good morning, everybody. Glad to have you here this morning again. It's not the most beautiful day we've seen this whole year, but, you know, it's not sleeting, it's not snowing, it's not hailing. It is light outside. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure where it is above zero, but it's someplace up there. It's not 72. It's not too bad. We managed to get up and get out, and everybody else did too, so it's not too bad. We'll, we'll, we'll take that. Uh, just glad again to be here this morning. Uh, you know, it's, it's the Christmas season. How many of how many of you have got your Christmas shopping done? Wow! I tell you what, you do. You you go find thirty six people someplace else and ask them. You'll see one little hand will kind of go up and say, "Mostly." I used to be a December 24th shopping. Boy, did I ever find out that was a bad deal. Didn't take me long. Uh, we've almost become a November 24th shopper or an October 24th shopper. Uh, it's a whole lot easier to go out there and get that done. But uh, it is the Christmas season. Uh, the most important thing I can say to you today is remember the true reason for the season. His name is Jesus Christ. Uh, there are arguments, and when we've talked about that in the, in the messages in the last few weeks, there are arguments about was he born actually? Was, was there actually a Jesus born? Uh, there's arguments about, well, when was he born? All of that stuff is unimportant. Uh, there's one important piece of information there, and that fact is he was born. When doesn't make any difference. Uh, where does? Uh, how does? Uh, we're we're, we're going to talk a little bit about that today, but the fact that he was. And you know, for hundreds of years, there never was a question, Mr. Barton. There was no question about Jesus Christ being born. And several hundred years after all of the old folks that had actually seen it, actually knew about it, uh, when they were dead, well, not forgotten, but you know, long since dead. Uh, then there began to be some people, well, you know, I don't really know about that. Maybe there was and maybe there wasn't a Jesus born. But in the actual date and time and place, nobody gave it a bit of an argument, Brother Ray. They knew there were too many witnesses out there. And uh, the fact that he was born just as prophesied, in the city of Bethlehem. That's, that's, that's what was told was going to happen. The wise men didn't know it for sure. Uh, but the people, <clears throat> the people of Israel knew they were looking for a Messiah. It was a thing that was going on at that time. So it's like, how many of you here are uh, impressed with the possibility of the temple being built in Israel? Get impressed if you're not. Because when that temple goes up, woohoo! Yeah, yeah. We're close. We're close. Uh, the temple is the next thing to bring on the prophecy scene. Move it back to Jesus Christ's day. The next thing on the prophecy scene was the birth of the Messiah. There were women who had... Okay, say that. There were women who had gone out and said, I am the mother of the Messiah. I am carrying the Messiah. They did that to get fame, glory, whatever else. Come on in, sis. We just got started. You can come in with us. Okay. They were trying 
to win fame and glory and you know what people, how bad people are They're always trying to get a buck out of something. Uh, they were trying to do that too. Every one of them had been exposed. Somewhere or another they had found out that this woman actually was not carrying the Messiah. She was carrying John's baby or Joe's baby or Bill's baby or whatever else. And she was taken out in many cases and stoned to death. When we, when we hear of people being stoned, we don't think too much about it. Well, they got stoned, you know, got a few rocks for them. No. The purpose of the stoning was to kill them. And to kill them in a slow, painful manner. If your friend was getting stoned, the best thing you could do is get a big rock and take it up and hit him in the head and knock him out. That sounds really crazy. That sounds mean and cruel. But that's the way it was done back then. And there were women who were trying to uh, put themselves up as being the uh, mother of the Messiah. We talked about that last week that uh, Mary knew about that. There were people that were seriously looking for the Messiah in the same manner that today there are people seriously looking for signs of the end times, things coming together, that uh, we're getting on this prophecy trail, we're getting close to it. Uh, there are people today looking for that. I'm one of them. I hear something that sounds like prophecy, boy, I jump right on it. <laughs> I kind of laugh at myself too because there's a... Uh, prophecy in scripture uh, that talks about uh, 7,000 people being killed and years ago uh, there were 7,000 people killed in an earthquake down in Mexico City. Now, many of you may not know this, Mexico City is physically the largest city in the world, or at least it was at the time. In fact, we were down to the center when that happened. And uh, we got the news about 7,000 people being killed. And I think I read that someplace. I got my Bible out and got my Bible dictionary and got my concordance out and over Randy and I, I searched that out. And right stream, wrong way, you know. But uh, there will be a day when that 7,000 is killed. There will be a day when the city is broken apart. Uh, that was part of that promise. But uh, again, today is the one of the days of December. It's one of the days to Think about and remember the reason for the season. His name is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, worship Him, not the presents. Worship Him, not the Christmas tree. Worship Him, not the fall of the rock that's going on. Just be glad that He wasn't born for us. Now, somebody want to stand up this morning and say they're glad for Jesus. They're glad to be saved. They're glad they're a Christian. They're glad to be here. Glad to be in a warm place. Who wants to be first this morning? Not everybody wants. We've got one guy back there that's kind of helping us out. Don't understand what he's saying, but that's okay. Anybody got a song? All hearts and minds clear. Well, today. Uh, as we move along in this very last month of the year, as we have down through this month, we recall that this is the last month of the year, but it also has the theme of the birth of our blessed Savior, Jesus Christ. In the last couple of weeks, we discussed the timing of the birth of Jesus, uh, and of course the fact that Jesus was born at all to uh, ideas that people want to fight, scratch, and argue about. We've already said it here earlier today. It doesn't make any difference when he was born. The fact that he was born is the important part. And while there are people out there who discuss and argue about whether or not Jesus actually was born, they cannot find any proof whatsoever that he was not born. But we, on the other hand, as Christians, have the testimony of literally thousands of people who knew who 
were there, who saw him, who saw his miracles, who saw him walk on the water, who saw him heal the blind eyes, who saw him raise the people from the dead. And the funny part about it, all of these people that decry Jesus Christ being born, they have nobody that they can say, well, my guy did that. My guy healed the, the sick. My guy raised the dead. My guy, you know, they don't, they don't have anybody. There might be some little anecdotal thing where somebody's sore toe got healed. But uh, that's all. Jesus Christ alone, Brother Randy, historically, raised the dead, healed the blinded eyes, healed the dead, healed the dumb. And I can go on and on. Being an old sailor, I, I, I hope nobody takes offense at this, but being an old sailor, the most important miracle he did that I know of was walking on that water. You see, I've been on that water. We were on the other side of Pearl Harbor at that time. The old man pulled the ship over and called a swim call, and he told us if we decided we wanted to go swimming, it's only 7,844 feet deep or whatever. I dove off the ship, and I swam, I don't know, probably from here to the other side of the property there, maybe a little bit farther. And I thought, you know, this really ain't a whole lot of fun. I mean, it's nice. It's, it's the ocean water. It's nice and clean. It's warm. But, you know, there's nobody out here. We, we can't play volley, you know, volleyball in the water or anything like that. All we can do is swim. I turned around and started swimming back towards the ship. And I looked up on the gun mount there. And there sits one of our gunner's mates. And he's got a little fold-up chair. I look at it real close. He's got him one grand rifle laying across his lap. I looked down a little bit closer and sat down by his feet are several little clips from an M1 Grand. They call them an M-block clip. Each one carries eight bullets. And I'm thinking to myself, why is he sitting up there on a gun mount with a rifle and extra bullets? I wonder what this is all about. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, I'm in the shark's red box. <laughs> you know? I don't need to be in here anymore. I swam over, got up on the little thing, climbed up, went and took a shower, went down the after instrument, said, hey, you guys want to go swimming? Go ahead, I'm here. Never did go swimming in that part of the ocean again. But we, we did things when we were younger that uh, might not have been the smartest things in the world that we did. But one of the things we did was we accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior. And that's what we want to talk about today, about Jesus Christ. The fact that he was born, the fact that he was probably born around the winter solstice is uh, historically true. The, uh, there's nothing out there to take away the proof that Jesus Christ was born. There's no substitute that can be put in His place. But uh, we talked about last week about Mary taking a chance on God. We talked two weeks ago about Joseph taking a chance on God. And today we want to change the story to the third person that's involved in this. That third person, of course, is Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ didn't have to take a chance on God. Jesus Christ took a chance on somebody else. And if you really want to know who it was, make believe you got a mirror in your hand and look at it. Jesus Christ took a chance on us. Jesus Christ took a chance that He would be able to come to earth. He would be able to go up on the mountain and preach the Sermon on the Mount and have people believe Him. He was able to get he took a chance that he would be able to have a reputation that when he came into Capernaum, the centurion of Capernaum would say, my sword can't do this, my army can't do this, my entire group of people can't do this, but I'm going to take a chance on this Jesus guy. Maybe he can heal my servant. And guess what happened? 
Jesus Christ healed his servant. But today, we do want to talk about Jesus Christ taking a chance on that personal ability. And I want to start out, this is going to be a little bit different. Brother Charlie, would you come up here, please? Brother Chuck, can you find somebody to handle that there young for a minute? I need you up here for just a second. Charlie, you stand over there. Chuck, I want you to stand here. I want you two to look at each other. <laughs> Charlie, I'm going to ask you a question. This is your son, Chuck, right? Yes. You love him? Yes. Is he, no, no, no. is he a good kid? Okay. If I gave you the opportunity to sacrifice him, I want you going to sacrifice him. The way you're going to do it is you're going to take him out and they're going to beat him. They're going to beat him hard. They're going to beat him big time. They're going to beat him to the point that you will not recognize him. You're going to nail him up on a tree. You're going to leave him up there until he dies. And the reason that you might do that is because there's a murderer in jail in Louisiana who took a gun in and shot down 19 people just to be doing it because their religion was different. The reason you're going to let him be sacrificed is because that guy might Say, well, you know, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Would you give your son a chance? Thank you. Let's go ahead and stand. Where's Sam? Sam, we're not here. Stay here, Charlie. Uh, or Chuck. Oh, I get to do it. Where's Sam go? He died from He died from Okay. I'm Sam. Bye. Same question. Would you give your son to be beaten to the point you can't recognize him? No. I wasn't going to ask Sam to come up because I was going to ask him the same question. When the question came up, would God do this? I think we all know the answer. I think we all know the answer when we ask the question, would God have done this? In the earlier stories, the story of Joseph taking a chance on God, Mary taking a chance on God, Naaman taking a chance on God. In all of those stories, God was the prime mover. He was the one making the offer. In this case, God is also going to be the prime mover. The first thing he did as a prime mover was he made a promise. And here's the promise that he made. But thou Bethlehem and Father, through thou, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be the Lord of Israel, whose greatest forth have been from old, from everlasting. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Our precious and most kind heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you, Father, for all of your blessings. Most importantly, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of being here and for everyone that has come to be with us this day. We also thank you, Father, when we would say, I can't do that. You said you could. When I couldn't give my son Daniel, and you know I couldn't. When we couldn't do that, you were not only willing, but you stepped forth and said, I will do this. With no reservation whatsoever. And we thank you, Father, that you did. Because without having done that, we couldn't say we are Christians. But because you did, we can say we're Christians. We thank you for that. Guide us and direct us. Help us in our understanding of all that Jesus did and that you did. 
for us. We give you the praise for Jesus. Jesus' name and all all said. The first thing that we want to see here is this prophecy was given all the way back about the time that Isaiah, Isaiah and Micah, Micah is the other prophet up here, they were contemporaries, kind of like Brother Dorsal and I are. We're in the same time frame of preaching and prophesying and ministering and so forth. Micah and Isaiah were in, the, in about that same time frame. Isaiah has this great big long book in your Bible there. Many chapters, many pages. <laughs> Micah's got this little bitty few pages in there. But this is one of the things that Micah was given by Almighty God. Micah was given the prophecy to tell the world God the Father is sending a Messiah. God the Father is sending one who's going to be the ruler of Israel. Now, is Jesus Christ the ruler of Israel today? No. Nope. Guess what that means? Sister Barb is coming. <laughs> If it hasn't happened yet, it's in the future. If it's in the future, we're looking forward to the day that it's coming to pass. The day that it's coming to pass, Sister Jane, when Jesus Christ is King of Israel, when He sets His foot on the mount, and we say, Glory, hallelujah. It's coming, folks. It ain't here yet, but it's coming. Praise the Lord. How many of you have been in the kitchen when somebody's baking an apple pie? Or a chocolate cake. Does that smell good? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sure does. And you think, wow, something good's coming out of that kitchen. And you can't wait to get in there. Well, that's the way we are with this. Just can't wait. But might see this happen. I've heard of it on and off all of my life. I keep hearing of it more and more with the things that are going on over there. It gets a little bit closer every day. In fact, today we're the closest that we've ever been. But the prophecy starts out with designating Bethlehem as the place which will emerge, where the Messiah will emerge. Then Daniel chapter 9 also talks about him. The second part of it, again, he will be the ruler of Israel. And the final part there, the last part, talks about his goings forth that been from old, from everlasting. If there ever was any doubt in your mind, ever any thought in your mind, and I know there's people out there that teaches this, well, you know, Jesus Christ never did really exist until he was born in the barn. Not garbage. Jesus Christ was there when God the Father said, let us make man in our image. He was right there. The book of John says that nothing was formed without. It said in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, and all things were formed by him. Nothing that was formed was formed without him. Jesus Christ was there from day one. In fact, Jesus Christ was there before the day was ever even made. There was a thing out there on Facebook a couple days ago about all of these things. Do you remember this? Remember that? Remember this? Remember that? You might be older than dirt. And I had to go in there and change it and make sure that they all understood ain't nobody older than dirt. Now there might be a few people, few people that are three days, just three days younger than dirt. But that's the closest you can get. Ain't nobody older than dirt. Dirt's older than we are by at least three days. But Jesus Christ is older than the dirt. Jesus Christ was there when God, and some of you ain't going to get this, but I'm going to tell you how it works anyway. The very first thing God had to create was nothing. Nothing is an entity. Nothing where there is no oxygen, there is no air, there is no light, there is nothing at all. That's a, a nothing. That did not exist until God created it. God created nothing so that He could create this whole entire world from that box of nothing. There's people out there that says, well, you know, I'm not sure about this God creation thing. I've studied the universe and I am absolutely amazed at the idea Convinced of the idea that there was a big bang. Does everybody here know what? I'm trying to think of the name of it. 
It's firecrackers about that long. It's got a fire. Got a fuse <coughs> coming out the side. M80. M80. Anybody here ever taken an M80 and put it in a can, maybe a can full of dirt or something? When you blew it up, did it make anything? When you had a big bang, did it make anything? No. Of course it didn't. <laughs> big bang is the dumbest thing I ever heard in my life. But they say, yes sir, there was a big bang that all of the world could have been held in a tablespoon if you could compare, if you could have compressed all the atoms and electrons and neurons and all of it. If you could compress it down to where there's no space between them, you could have held it in a tablespoon. All of the stars, the moon, the sun, everything could have held it in a tablespoon. People are dumber than a box of rocks, brother. Eddie. Let me tell you how the world the world came about. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it says he created them from nothing. But Jesus Christ was there when this all happened, of course. And again, we talked about with Joseph and Mary, God was the prime mover. In this particular part here where Jesus is involved, God the Father is not only the prime mover, but he becomes an equal participant. And the way he does this is this verse right here. If you notice, and most of you know, I didn't put the whole thing up there. Because there's a very specific word in there I want you to see this morning. For God so loved the world that he gave. Brother Randy, you got your go full with you today? You got your go full with you today? I think. No, it's not him. I forget who it was. I got, I got a friend that keeps from getting his bill for But you've got yours with you. Okay. Can I give, can I stand right here and say, Brother Norson, I give you Brother Randy's bill for Can I do that? No. I mean, he's sitting there trying to figure out what I'm going to say. No, I can't do it because it's not mine to give. I don't own it. I, it's, it's, it's not altogether in my control. What did you bring out there on the, on the thing? Pie? Pie? What kind of pie? Chocolate. Chocolate pie. Oh, that's for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not giving you chocolate pie. <laughs> it's not mine to give, it's hers. If she chooses to give it, and that's the important part, if she chooses to give pie, now she can buy her and take that pie, grab her a fork and eat a piece as she's walking out of the car, open up the trunk, stick it in her, and eat the all and just out of luck. If she chooses not to give it, I can say I hope she does, and I do. But if she, if she chooses not to, that's on her. And that's where we are. With God the Father and God the Son. Let me tell you about this God the Father, God the Son thing. God the Father opened up an opportunity for somebody. For somebody to become a sacrifice. And that sacrifice. Sister Nine was for you. Brother Mike was for you. Brother Charlie was for you. Raise your hand, Sister Gary. That was for you too. And sacrifice was offered as the job. I'm sorry, not the sacrifice. The job of being sacrificed was offered. Gabriel couldn't do it. He's just an angel. Archangel he is, but he's just an angel. Michael couldn't do it. Why? He's just an angel. Anybody here got a guardian angel? Raise your hand. Y'all do. Yeah. They can't do it. I couldn't do it. Dorsal couldn't do it. Randy couldn't do it. There was only one who could do it. His name was Jesus Christ. God the Father could not give 
Jesus Christ until Jesus Christ said, Dad, I'll do it. And if some of you take offense to that bad thing, don't, please don't. Because over in the New Testament, we find a phrase called Abba. Abba, Father. You translate that straight across to the most perfect words you can find, it's Daddy. Daddy. There is a difference between a father and a dad. Let me tell you about that difference. World of difference between a father and a dad. God the Father is our dad. God the Father was the daddy of Jesus Christ. But going back to the opening remarks, Jesus Christ was given the opportunity to become the sacrificial lamb. Jesus Christ was given the opportunity to become the Messiah. God the Father could not tell him to do it. Because if he did, then he took away the one thing that Jesus Christ does have that you have also, and that is your free will to do what you want to do. Jesus Christ had that same free will. Let me tell you something, friends. When Jesus Christ was nailed on that cross and they dropped it down in the hole, those 12 legions of angels were still waiting. All he had to do was say, I'm done. It's over. I'm getting it. 12 legions of angels down across the Screaming down through heaven would have come and rescued him. And I would not have wanted to have been any one of the people that put him on that cross on that particular day. But Jesus Christ did not call the angels. Jesus Christ looked ahead in time. And as I said earlier, he saw you. And he saw me. He saw us in our sins. He saw us as, our, as the imperfect individuals every one of us are. And he also saw one more thing. It just lifts me up, fires me up, it makes me go. That one more thing that he saw was without him, I had no chance, Brother Chuck. I couldn't pray to Michael. I couldn't pray to Abraham. I couldn't pray to my guardian angel. Because there was no sacrifice that would have been equivalent enough for my sins, let alone the sins of the entire world. Without him, and he knew this, he looked ahead in time. He's God. He can do that. He can look ahead in time see what's going on. Know what's happening out there. He knew if he was on the cross and he stayed on the cross and he died on the cross and he lifted up his head and said, Father God, it's finished. He knew if he did that that on January 25th, 1977, I could raise my hand and say, Father God, I'm sorry for what I did. And he could say, you're forgiven. It's like, Woo! Oh, that was the only way it could be done, though. Was if God the Father says, Son, can you do this? And the Son says, Dad, I'm going to do it. And he did. Praise the sweet name of Jesus. We talked about Naaman taking a chance on God. Joseph took a chance on God. Mary took a chance on God. Well, Jesus took a chance on you. He took a chance on me. And I'm so glad today <laughs> that that chance took Brother Charter. He took a chance on me and it worked out. So today, I just want to share with you as we get ready to close. One of these days, that said the trumpet's going to blow. One of these days, he's going to put a foot on the Mount of Olives in Israel. He's going to become the king of Israel that we see up there in the scripture of, according to him. And then when that's all taken care of, we're going to heaven together. I want to say hundreds of thousands, but that's wrong. It's got to be billions. Maybe even billions. I, I have no idea how many people are going to be in heaven. The one thing I know about heaven for sure is it ain't never got any bigger. Hell has enlarged this board. The Bible says so. It says if hell hath enlarged her borders to take on those that are coming there. Thank God I'm going to be there. But this morning, 
heaven is going to be, I, I can promise you, heaven is going to be filled with us folks. Us folks who trusted him because he took a chance on us. As we stand this morning, Sister Sandy's not here to lead us in page 81. But the Sister Rosie comes and plays softly on the piano. Let me say to you that Jesus Christ took a chance on us. And that chance will never be tossed aside. Jesus Christ took a chance on us that we might come to Him and say, Father God, in Jesus' name, I'm sorry for what I did. If we do that, I guarantee you promise, your needs will be met. Your life will be changed for the better. And in any other case, Christ will come to you. As she plays this morning, let me ask you this morning, is there one that would say, Brother White, I need prayer? The Bible says, if you have any sick amongst you, let them call for the elders of the church. They will walk from the hall and pray the prayer of faith over them. There is any sick you forget. Uh -huh. The Bible also says, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest.
Lord, only you may heal. We ask for your healing for that, Lord Father. And as we travel today, Lord Father, we pray that your hand will be with us. Lord, to guide us, watch over us until our next gathering, Lord Father. And Lord, uh, we would ask a blessing on the food that's out here.